So here we have a Yamaha SPX90 version 2, which is a 16-bit um, digital effects rack from the late 80s. Um, these can be picked up really cheaply on eBay. I've picked this up for £99. Um, and there's a few things going on with it, which um, hopefully I'm going to cover. I'm going to replacing the screen. Uh, the, the mains lead I've already replaced. There was a problem with that. Um, the backup battery has been replaced. Uh, I've reset the programming on it, um, and it needs SIM capacitors changing as well. Um, these are all very, very common um, problems with these machines of this age. This, is, this was made in the late 80s, so 30, 30 plus, 33 years old. Um, capacitors over that time, um, they simply don't last, they dry out. So let's take the lid off this thing and have a look. There's seven screws to get the, to get the lid off. They're all fairly similar screws. Um, some of the threads sometimes change, so I just use a little magnetic mat to keep them uh, in groups. This one, certainly on the, the casing, looks like it's had a bit of a, a tough life. When I first turned it on, actually, the, um, a lot of the presets were from, uh, they had labels on them like Radio Gaga Lead and Phil Collins Intro, this sort of thing. So I suspect it's been used by Covers Band over the last, or well, certainly recently, um, and in its 30 plus years of life. So there's the seven screws off, there's the lid. So you can see. The components uh, within the system now, you have obviously the mains lead. This is a 240 volt version. This is the power supply board system here. Um, this is the main board. It's one circuit board, but it's clearly divided into two. You can see a break in the line here down the board. This is the digital processing side um, with some fairly proprietary chips. There's Yamaha chips, memory chips, uh, Toshiba microprocessor, Tachi microprocessor. If you look on the dates on some of these, um, certainly these, these are B, uh, the Burr Brown DAX. The dates on this is 87, uh, April 1987. And you've got other chips in here, similar kind of era, 87. So I'd say this is probably built in the third quarter of 1987. So this size is all the analog pathway. Obviously you've got mono input here, unbalanced, and left and right stereo output. These two switches give you plus four or minus 20 uh, dB gain. Um, and this is all digital processing with a backup battery to retain um, programming in the EEPROM. So uh, I can see a number of issues here already. Um, there's some problems with the capacitor on the power supply, which we'll come to in a second. Now this mains lead, the original mains lead that was on this unit was very short. It was only maybe eight or 10 inches long. It had an Euro IEC connector on the end, so clearly this unit had been in a rack with a power distribution unit built into the rack, which I don't have. I, um, I don't work in that sort of way. I have a, a, a stable setup in, in my studio. So I took a standard um, mains lead, um, cut the end off, stripped it back. This connector here is quite tricky to ease around. The way to get around this and to strip the lead back is to cut the wire off here with a pair of pliers and then to pull each of these cores out one by one. Um, in doing so this wire then collapses, you can pull the sheath through and this then just pops out and you can replace the lead. One thing to bear in mind when you're putting a new plug or a new lead on this sort of thing is the fuse rating. This unit only pulls 20 watts so it's very very light on power um, so you need a small fuse. This is a 5 amp fuse which for this unit I think is probably too big. So I'm just going to flip this out and replace it with a 3 amp fuse. Won't make any difference to the unit at all, but what it does mean is if something shorts, 
within the unit and creates heat. Um, it could draw more power, therefore the three amp fuse is more likely to blow before you have a fire than the old five amp fuse. So that's one thing just to keep in mind when you replace leads. With respect to some of the other things I've done with this, this battery here, now in these units they have a three volt battery which has got soldered points and they go through the um, holes on the circuit board, the through hole mounts, and soldered on the underside. Just for convenience, these batteries, they don't last terribly long, um, and I try and replace these every four or five years. If I see one that's already soldered to the board, I take it out altogether. Take the board out, undo the, the mountings, dewire the board, take it out, take the old battery out and put a new battery mount in. These are the battery mounts that I use. Um, they're standard CR203 2032 mounts. Obviously, make sure it's a 3 volt backup battery. Um, these pins are usually too far apart for uh, the through hole. So, the way I did this, I saw a chap on one of the YouTube channels. He had a really good idea to just make a small groove here with a, a knife or a Dremel or something along those lines. Solder a piece of wire onto this negative pin. So, it's quite long, about that sort of long. Uh, length. Uh, you can get this wire very easily, it's just uh, you clip off the through hole connector on a capacitor or a resistor, um, make it about so long, solder it, and then you just fold this over so it's horizontal. You measure the pin distance on your battery and then just bend the wire up so you end up with this sort of fashion coming up like this. And then place it onto the board, as you can see here, and just solder it on the underside, and that's good to go. Um, so that's the battery and the mains lead um, and what I'm going to do now is just focus a little bit more on some of the circuitry here and show you some of the problems that these uh, machines have over time um, and then we'll come to the screen replacement um, that will end this this first video the second one uh, I'm waiting for the delivery of the replacement capacitors for the whole board and uh, that should come in the next week week or ten days once I've got those in place then we'll go through the resoldering of all of this equipment and hopefully we'll have something that is uh, going to last another 20, 30 years. So here we have the power supply unit for uh, this SPX90 version 2. Um, you can see obviously 240 volts coming in here. There's a 1.25 amp fuse here protecting the circuitry. Um, some transformers and we've got a large capacitor here. This is a 68 microfarad 400 volt capacitor. And you can see this capacitor is completely blown. Uh, any bowing on the top of a capacitor, um, signs of corrosion, or, um, uh, well, any bulging really, uh, it tells you this capacitor is destroyed. It would only be a matter of time, really, before this sort of thing would uh, cause a major problem and failure of the board. Often when these units come um, dead, you buy them from, well, eBay, Re eBay Reverb, wherever, um, and they say, you know, not working. The first place to look is is this because this can be replaced for a few pounds uh, as in the, the components replaced for a few pounds and you can very well end up with a, a perfectly salvageable unit um, that works well so looking at this this capacitor is gone thankfully it looks like it hasn't leaked you'll find on the board some brown glue there's some here um, this is used by the manufacturer back in well, when it was made 1987 to secure the components on the board for soldering um, so this is just aged with time. This power supply runs very, very hot. Um, so you, any capacitors that are replaced need to be uh, very tolerant of, of high temperatures. You can see also, I suspect, I haven't looked too closely. I know this capacitor is leaking here. I don't know if you can just see some corrosion there and some peeling back of the, of the, of the casing. There's also there's a, a diode here, which has clearly got some corrosion on it which just needs a bit of cleaning off. Um, I've cleaned most of that off already. Um, this still works, um, so I'm not too worried about having to replace this just at the moment, but these capacitors all need to re be replaced. These two are the only ones, these two here, are the only ones of s showing signs of um, severe problems. Um, but I'm replacing all of them anyway whilst I'm there because they've been there 30 years. They'll be dried out, and at some point they'll they'll go, they'll just stop working or fail. 
Um, this is the power supply output to the two boards. This one here goes to the audio board and the other one supplies the voltage for the um, digital side of the board. So this capacitor is blown. This is on the way to me here, and these capacitors also here have gone. These are all Nitricon capacitors. Originally, they're a very good brand, um, but clearly they've had their day. Um, and I'm aiming to replace these with Panasonic's, high-end Panasonic capacitors. Now, as far as finding the right capacitors to replace them with, um, you can head for the same capacitors again. I've tried hunting for a Nitricon 68 microfarad 400 volt. I can't find one. Maybe it's the suppliers I was looking at, um, but I found a Panasonic, which will be a good replacement. Uh, the capacitors in here, I'm using general Panasonic uh, star capacitors or make capacitors. And hopefully once this is all done, this will give us another well, 20, 30 years of use. Um, just be careful when you're dealing with capacitors because these hold charge. So if you do power this thing on, and then handle the board in the wrong way, you will get a shock off it. So just be careful with them. Um, so I think that's really covered the power board. So we've got a little bit of corrosion here. I would think probably from a leak from this capacitor next to it. So these all need replacing, and this one has clearly, clearly gone. Um, so that's the power board. So just moving across the unit to the, um, the main, main boards. Two halves, this to really, uh, two halves to this really. It's one circuit board, but there's two discrete uh, elements to it. One is the analog pathway side, which is here. Um, two Burr Brown digital audio converter chips, uh, digital analog, sorry, converters. Um, and then this is the, uh, the digital side of the board that actually does the changes to the digital signal um, to give you the reverb and the effects, and then it's fed back through the, the Burr Brown um, DAX and out through the um, audio pathway. Now these capacitors here, there's a few of them, they all look reasonably good. There isn't one in here that shows signs of bulging or corrosion, but as I mentioned earlier, they've been there 30 years, they're going to be dried out, this unit runs hot. There is this barrier here between the two halves, so you'd expect this to be a bit cooler, but essentially it's a closed box, there's no real venting on this system. Um, so these are all going to be exposed to some heat for quite some time. There's also some brown staining on the circuit boards, um, and I'm fairly confident this is part of the um, manufacturing process using uh, flux. Uh, it certainly doesn't seem to cause a problem. This unit works, and it's incredibly difficult to clean off. Uh, so the unit works. I'm sort of adopting the approach to this, that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But these capacitors, whilst they're not officially broke, they will break at some point within their 30 years plus. Um, so I'll rep be replacing those. Now, just careful when you're looking at them. Almost all of them have a polarity, but there's a few in here that are bipolar. Uh, there's one there, uh, I think. And there's a couple up here as well. So just be careful uh, about which ones um, yeah, or the replacements that you're putting in. As far as the bipolar uh, capacitors are concerned, I'm going to be using um, uh, Nitricon Muse ES uh, capacitors. And these are very high quality um, capacitors indeed. As far as the other audio capacitors are concerned, I'm going to be using um, ELNA RFS um, capacitors, which are designed specifically for audio pathways and should give us a uh, as clean a signal as we can have um, with this sort of age of uh, hardware. So these are all becoming, these, all these capacitors for the main circuit board and also the power supply will be coming in the next 10 days or so and that will be the, the bulk of the second video. So we've covered the battery, that's been changed, I've changed the mains cable, we've covered the, the issues with the capacitors on here. Um, this unit does actually work and we can see that. see that screen. The screen's a bit dim. That's something else that goes with the units at this time. Something just to, to test when you're looking at these units. The audio input comes in through here. It's a mono input 
and it goes directly through this pot. So this is your input level. So one thing just to look at is just to turn this pot once you've got some power running through it. There's no signal going through this, but what you sometimes see is a signal being generated by turning this pot. And you'll see this um, level meter clicking uh, or displaying a, a signal as you turn the pot. That's a, signal, that's a sign that the, the pot in here has corroded. It might just need cleaning, it might need replacing. But either way, when you get a signal running through this and you turn this, if you're seeing this on here, no signal, when you put a signal through, you're going to get lots of static and lots of crackling. So this needs either cleaning or, or replacing altogether. You can see the display is, is there, but it's a little dim. I'm just going to turn this off, just aware of that capacitor. So the displays in these old synthesizers have a common feature in them in that behind the actual display unit, creating the image that you see and recognize as text or a graph or whatever, there is an electroluminescent panel which gives the light through the unit. Now these electroluminescent panels just fade with age. Um, it's very easy to repair these. The larger panels, you can actually replace the electroluminescent panel itself. Uh, I've got a Korg O1RW, which I'll create a video on um, in the coming weeks, and that display had completely failed. So I took the display out and replaced it with a new OLED display, which is what I'm going to do with this SPX90. And uh, you have then a nice new, very, very bright, low power display. Um, there are other advantages of changing to the OLED displays, which I'll cover more with the with the Core Go 1RW. But this display in this SPX90 is the same as the display in a TX81Z, which I've also uh, repaired and will create a video on again in the upcoming weeks. This is the display that's going to replace it. It's an OLED display. It's got the same um, characters on there. It's got the same header. So this will just fit straight in. Something else I noticed about this unit uh, when I first received it was that these buttons weren't working properly the buttons to edit the machine. Um, and I suspect that's why it was being sold so cheaply on eBay, was that the utility buttons especially would allow you access to the edit menus, but it, you couldn't then get out of the menu because the button would fail. Um, and as I found, it was simply because they were dirty, and I'll show you how to clean those as well. Um, so on with the screen change. I've taken most of the screws out already. Uh, so a series of screws on the front here, on the top and the bottom, so we just remove those. As I said, I've already taken the screws out on the bottom, so these are all out now. So to get this front panel off, all the screws need to be removed, and then you just separate the, the rack tabs here with a, a little spacer. There's, one. There's no glue or anything on these, it just helps ease it off. And there we go. So that's the, the front panel removed. And then the screen needs to come out now. I'll just run through the front of this. Um, if you notice, there's a couple of capacitors here as well. I'm replacing those just because I'm there, um, and it's a two-second job to do that. That's your level meter. Um, discussed briefly, that's the pot that controls the input signal. And if it's, if it's dirty, we'll give you static, which will result in a signal there. This is simply a, um, a display giving you the, the patch number. Here's the main screen, which is about to come out, and this is the buttons. I'll come on to the buttons once I've replaced the screen. So to replace the screen is very easy. And the replacement screens you pick up on eBay or Reverb or any other auction site, really. Um, they vary in price. I bought these in, uh, in the UK on eBay. There's one screw. And here's the other one. Now, there's a little trick to getting this panel out easily. There's two screws at the top, so undo both of those. Yeah, there we go. And then there's two hooks in this metal front panel, which go into two holes on the bottom of the screen. So just tip the screen forward. Give a bit of slack on the cable. And there we go. It's now disconnected from the panel. Disconnect the header. And this wire here is the power supply for the... Uh, electroluminescent panel, so it's coming out. Let's feed it through there, and that header through there. Okay, so that's the old screen gone, and the new screen goes in, and it's simply a reverse of the process. There's only one lead on this new screen because these OLED screens don't have an EL panel, so there's no extra power supply required. And again, just the fiddly bit is getting those little hooks in the holes. There's one, and there's two. 
dip it up and put the screws back in. make sure that the header is plugged in the correct way around. It's a little notch on the header and there's a notch in the socket. So if it doesn't go in easily, don't force it. Just make sure the notch is matched up. And there we go, that's in. So now we're going to move on to the um, button panel here, which uh, caused a problem when I first received this unit. Um, so we need to disconnect the connectors and then just ease the panel out, which is very straightforward. Um, these connectors just need a little bit of encouragement. Just to disconnect the very simple locking mechanism, there's one. And there's two. Okay. So one wire goes over the top, one wire goes underneath the frame of the front panel and these buttons then just ease out. That's it. So these are the buttons um, which when I received the unit weren't working properly. The utility button wasn't working. Um, parameter button wasn't working. Uh, they'd work intermittently but that was a problem because you'd get into an edit menu and then nothing would, um, nothing would work. You wouldn't be able to get out of that menu system. So you find each button in turn, I did them in turn because I'm not good, um, my memory's not good enough to remember where they all go. So just ease them out really gently because the green surround to these buttons is so fragile. So just work around the, the button. There you go. And it will just, there we go, come off. Okay, so there's the switch underneath. And all you need to do is spray it with some contact cleaner. Um, I used some uh, stoner contact cleaner, which I bought locally in a hardware store, and spray the button, and it will clean the contact, and hopefully um, the button should then start to work properly, which is what happened in my case. So all of these buttons now work as new. Once you've done that and allowed it to dry, then you replace the button back over the top, or the, the cap over the top of the button. There we go. and pass this wire back under the frame where it originally went. went. So make sure it's the correct way round. Just drop it into the socket, and this one goes over the top. Drop that into the socket, and then slot. There's a little tab on the end of this, on the right hand end. <coughs> So that's now sat in place. We've replaced the screen, we've cleaned the buttons, and then we put the front panel back on. I'm just going to put a couple of screws on here just to hold it in for expediency. And you should be able to see, hopefully, that the panel is much brighter. There's a little bit of a knack to getting this in, in that the, the green surround of these buttons exactly fits, exactly fits the cutout of the front panel. Um, so you need to really match that up well, and it just needs a bit of jiggling sometimes. So there we go, I've done that. So we're going to put, screw the front panel back on, there we go. Like I say, I'm just putting a couple of screws in just to hold it. bright OLED screen and all the buttons work as they should. So we to utility, hold it. There 
we go back out of utility and recall. There we go. So you can see that the OLED screen is much brighter. Um, it draws less power and it's an improvement. Um, this unit will give us another 20, 30 years of life and uh, the next video will cover the replacement of the capacitors which really needs to be done looking at that capacitor on the power supply board. Um, So now we're going to move on to the um, button panel here, which uh, caused a problem when I first received this unit. Um, so we need to disconnect the connectors and then just ease the panel out, which is very straightforward. Um, these connectors just need a little bit of encouragement. Just to disconnect the very simple locking mechanism, there's one. There's two. Okay. So one wire goes over the top, one wire goes underneath the frame of the front panel, and these buttons then just ease out. That's it. So these are the buttons um, which, when I received the unit, weren't working properly. The utility button wasn't working, um, parameter button wasn't working. Uh, they'd work intermittently, but that was a problem because you'd get into an edit menu and then nothing would, um, nothing would work. You wouldn't be able to get out of that menu system. So you find each button in turn. I did them in turn because I'm not good, um, my memory's not good enough to remember where they all go. So just ease them out really gently because the green surround to these buttons is so fragile. So just work around the, the button. There you go. And it will just... There we go, come off. Okay, so there's the switch underneath. And all you need to do is spray it with some contact cleaner. Um, I used some uh, stoner contact cleaner, which I bought locally in a hardware store. And spray the button and it will clean the contact and hopefully um, the button should then start to work properly, which is what happened in my case. So all of these buttons now work as new. Once you've done that and allowed it to dry, then you replace the button back over the top, or the, the cap over the top of the button. There we go. And pass this wire back under the frame where it originally went. went. So make sure it's the correct way round. Just drop it into the socket. And this one goes over the top. Drop that into the socket and then slot, there's a little tab on the end of this, on the right hand end. <coughs> Can't seem to find that. There we go, done. Okay, so that's now sat in place. We've replaced the screen, we've cleaned the buttons, and then we put the front panel back on. I'm just gonna put a couple of screws on here just to hold it in for expediency and you should be able to see hopefully that the panel is much brighter. There's a little bit of a knack to getting this in in that the the green surround of these buttons exactly fits, exactly fits the cutout of the front panel. Um, so you need to really match that up well and it just needs a bit of jiggling sometimes. So there we go, I've done that. So we're going to put screw the front panel back on. There we go. Like I say, I'm just putting a couple of screws in just to hold it. So you'll be able to see, there we go, a nice bright OLED screen 
and all the buttons now work as they should. There we go, I'll just click this off again. <coughs> so, in this first video, we've gone through placing the battery and the battery mount, placing the mains cable, some details around the capacitors and some of the circuitry. We've replaced the screen, we've replaced the, or repaired, sorry, the, the dirty, dirty buttons on the front of the unit, and a little bit of detail about the input port, if that's dirty, what symptoms you'll see from that. So the next video will go through replacing all the capacitors, um, and it will be interesting actually to measure the capacitance of some of these, especially this one, when it comes out, um, and to see how accurate uh, or how degraded they've been over the last 30 years in a unit that runs hot. So if you like this video, please uh, subscribe, hit the like button underneath. If you've got any comments or suggestions, please let me know. If there's any synthesizers you want to see being torn down and repaired, uh, again, let me know. Um, I've got videos coming up, obviously, the second part of this, of the recap of this effects unit, but also um, planning uh, TX81Z uh, repair and recap uh, Korg 01RW from um, the early 90s, the 01 series, which is a phenomenal machine that has a number of issues. Uh, the Roland JV1080, the Super JV, is another great machine, um, which is an easy fix, and they've picked up the, all of these machines are picked up very cheaply now on eBay. Um, and other machines, uh, I've got a Korg Trinity TR rack, which we can run through. Um, and others on the way. Um, I'm planning to, to purchase a few others as they're running very cheaply at the moment. So let me know if you want to see anything. Hit the subscribe and like and see you next time. Thanks for your time. Cheers.